So at this time, we'll move on to our presentations. And Mr. Cannon, you have the floor. Thank you all for having me. I'm Brian Cannon. I'm the executive director of One Virginia 2021. It's a coalition of Virginians uh, for fair redistricting. So I've got a PowerPoint slide that I think makes this a little bit easier. Uh, Don, can you tell me where we are on this? Oh, just the on the bar, on the task bar on the bottom. Oh, you're right on the task bar. Okay, gotcha. Perfect. Uh, there we go. Um, so I will uh, kind of the... the the heart of this and what drives redistricting reform home for most folks isn't the crazy maps that we have that you guys have all seen before, but it's actually this question is, was, is does this really count? And for those of you uh, who are millennials uh, and this might not know that this is a person voting behind a closed thing, I've been told that uh, some people don't always get that, but this is a person voting and the question is does this really count if we don't have redistricting reform? And, and that's a question I think... Um, uh, is, is really pertinent as we think about the, how we redistrict in Virginia. Um, I want to talk about a, a word fair for a second before we start out because our title has the word fair and it's fair redistricting. And I occasionally get asked by folks, um, is the word fair trying to benefit somebody? And we, we uh, which sounds an, an, an antithetical, but nonetheless is, is, a, is a question because some people use it as a word to like, you know, advantage one group or another. We are not. We are as multipartisan as you can imagine. Every day I spoke, speak to folks on the far right, far, far left, and then everybody in the middle, uh, and, and plenty of them who just could care less about a party and just want government to work. And so when we say fair, we mean fair to the citizens of Virginia. We don't have an agenda. We don't even have a, uh, a desired uh, outcome for any party or another. We've got uh, just having a fair process and kind of let the chips fall where they may. So when we say fair, that's that's in, important to note. Um, but I'm going to start with the kind of the problem of, of redistricting uh, and how we do it now. Uh, the current way Virginia does redistricting is just a bill through the General Assembly. It's as political as any other bill, a tax hike, a tax cut, a uh, Medicare expansion, Medicare not expansion. Um, and, and what happens is is that there's all the usual uh, horse trading, if it's, if it's sausage making, if you will, right, that, um, that goes through. The problem is is that this involves, this happens once a decade, and it's probably the, when, when it does happen, it's the worst form of, of, our, of our government. It's the worst form of politicians because it's really politicians picking their voters, right? And they do it once a decade. Uh, and so it creates quite a, quite a kind of backwards uh, republic, uh, as you would envision a republic working. Um, but here's what drives it home for, for me personally, and this could be anybody's street. It's not mine, but it's, mine's basically divided like this. Uh, my wife and I live in South Richmond, uh, is that they draw lines through our neighborhoods and they carve them up and they carve up our communities and our towns. And for voter registrars, they carve up our precincts uh, and they make um, what otherwise would be have no rhyme or reason logic behind why would they draw a line down the street. Um, and it just doesn't represent our communities at all. Except it does make sense if you view it through the lens of they're just trying to get reelected, right? And that's what the kind of underlying problem here is that politicians are picking their voters so they can get reelected, and then, or and, and in some cases so they can carve out people who might challenge them, um, which is a whole other nasty side of this. Um, and they're good at it. Um, if you uh, here's here's a Washington Post example um, from the their Wonk blog about kind of the ways you could redistrict. And if you look at kind of the, the one on the left with the 50 people, you've got 60% are blue and 40% are red. And number one and number two are, are kind of uh, uh, unattainable ideals, right? There's perfect representation and there's compact representation because we want compact districts that make sense. Um, but those are unfair. What we end up with is mostly the third chart here, which is neither compact nor fair. And it's driven only to ensure that there are more, in this case, red districts carved out of uh, what would otherwise be a majority blue uh, rectangle here. So that's just a kind of a basic uh, thing. But to say that they're good at it would um, is almost sh uh, shortchanging it. So people who redistrict and who control the power to redistrict um, are so good at it that if you took all of these dots, which there are 600 on your screen, um, sorry if this is uh, overwhelming to look at, but if there's 600 dots on your, there are 600 dots on your screen, and of the those 600 dots represent each general election, so the November election for the House of Delegates. There are 600. Um, uh, there's 100 members of the House of Delegates, and if you, these would be one per e for each of those elections since 2003, they're elected every two years. Uh, so that's six election cycles. 100 dots, 600 dots. This is how many dots would have flipped by an incumbent losing. 
19. That's 3.176% uh, flipping because of an incumbent lost. And, and this shouldn't be news to anybody. We know that our, our approval rates of our politicians are drastically lower than our reelection rates. And, and it's because they know exactly how to draw districts, how to carve up our communities to get exactly what they, they need out of them, which is, is reelection. And I think the bottom line is this gives a big old black eye to our republic, and we ought to think about it like that because um, Virginia and our, and, our, and our country can do better than this. Um, uh, there, there's an, this isn't a new problem. Uh, in fact, if I, if I recall from history, um, I, I, Mike Singer is uh, one of the uh, is, uh, Dr. Uh, Singer is, a, so, is a, associated with One Virginia, and he just wrote a book on Becoming Madison, and uh, he mentioned that one of the earliest gerrymanders is actually Governor Patrick Henry helping to gerrymander James Madison out of his district um, back in the founding. So our forefathers were good at this too, uh, and it's always been a problem, but it's getting acute now, uh, and it's getting acute now for one big reason, and that is computerized redistricting. Uh, there was a recent Daily Show episode where they talked about redistricting uh, and the kind of shenanigans that go along with gerrymandering, and they interviewed a, a consultant who goes around the country and, and draws up districts, kind of the, the partisan gerrymandering guy, and they showed some B-roll of him with a uh, table in front of him, a drafting table and these big maps and taking a pen to it, and, and that's just not how it happens. It happens on a computer now. In fact, the current Senate map that we live under now for our state Senate was drawn by Democrats in under two hours. It was the first plan was rejected. They had to go back and fix a bunch of things, and they were able to do it within two hours. And that's 40 districts. So it's the whole Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, the millions of people, and they did it in two hours. And it's because they can do that. And it's and it's this ability to get it down, uh, not just to carve up our communities, but when they do it, to be able to know that this is a 52.4 percent. Democratic district, or this is a 61.8% Republican district, and to know exactly how safe their members are or are not in those districts. And that's what the, the, the real problem is. It also allows them to do things like carve out individuals who are going to run against others, right? So one, one incumbent politician view, wor is worried that somebody in that neighborhood uh, is going to run against him. Well, you can ask for that, to, that particular street to be carved out. And I would love to say that that's just something that rarely happens. But unfortunately, the more I go around talking to the folks about this, the more I hear staffers coming up to me saying, you won't believe what happened, right? This blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's a regular horse trading. It's, it's, it's perverse to democracy. Uh, the natural inclination for people to say is, well, who's responsible for this? And I, and I don't want to neglect that because these are, um, when I tell the story, these are um, uh, two of the biggest um, obstacles in redistricting reform. The, the gentleman leaning over is Delegate Cole. Um, he represents part of Fredericksburg and, and Stafford. Um, and then the gentleman to his right is the Speaker. Uh, so so uh, the Speaker of the House, They're, these are both folks that are opposed to this. Um, this bill, reform bills, generally speaking, for the state of Virginia, uh, Commonwealth of Virginia, pass the Senate fairly regularly, either unanimously or with minimal bipartisan opposition. Um, but they, even Republican sponsored bills, get shut down in a very small subcommittee of the Privileges and Elections Committee. And it's, it's a subcommittee that uh, Chairman Cole serves on, and Chairman Cole also appoints all the members because he's the chair of the Privileges and Elections Committee. So he's a large part responsible for reform. I've had a number of Republicans tell me that if we got this issue to the floor of the House and had a straight up or down vote, it'd pass. Because generally speaking, there aren't a lot of people that stand up and say, I'm really pro-gerrymandering. It's a small group, uh, and it mostly involves elected people there. It's a unicorn to find an average citizen who says, I really love the way politicians pick their voters every 10 years. Um, but I'd be remiss if I just made this a Republican issue, because the, uh, there are two gentlemen in the other side of the chamber who are equally opposed to redistricting reform. And these are both, uh, but the first, by the way, were Republicans. I'm sure most of you all know that. These two gentlemen are Democrats, and, and that's uh, Dick Sasslaw. He's the leader of the Democratic now minority in the Senate, and then George Barker uh, um, on the right there, and he is a, 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 a senator from Fairfax, both from the Fairfax area. And they, uh, you know, stood up and opposed our bills. Um, they voted for a few of them that are the more kind of generic uh, bills, but they've opposed both of our bills. So we've got the, we've got people on both sides of the aisle that that uh, that support us, and and more often than not support us. But we do have opposition on both sides. Um, so I, I don't want to leave you guys with a thought that this is just uh, the Speaker and, and Chairman Cole being um, – the good news is that these folks were in the minority in the Senate and they were outvoted. Um, on our, our worst bill was 
uh, was 27 to 12, right? And so we have a, a strong bipartisan majority in favor of that, and many of our bills passed unanimously. Um, I liken it to this, is that you get a, if you think about Lord of the Rings for a second, if you'll indulge me, is that you have a nice hobbit. And if you know anything about Lord of the Rings, these hobbits are excellent, wonderful people that have multiple breakfasts and multiple lunch and multiple dinners, and they're just kind and generous. And then there's this ring, this powerful, all-powerful ring that they can put on their hand, and they can do so much with this. And you get it, and what happens when you get a hold of it for too long is you turn into Gollum. And that's what happens to these otherwise good politicians who are out there trying to serve as they get the uh, power and the taste of it uh, of redistricting reform. And it is all powerful. As I showed you, they can pretty much predict who wins in the general elections. Uh, and they turn into to Gollum here, which is unfortunate because even the best of our politicians can be susceptible to it. Um, but I don't want to leave Gollum up there on the slide for too long, and it's more important we talk about the solution. Uh, so uh, fixing this is, is what we're here for. And I'll say that the solution is a lot easier. The solution is an independent, uh, independent commission with a nonpartisan criteria. It's not complex. The idea is first off with the independent commission, get it out of the hands of the General Assembly. They can't do it. It's, a, it's an inherent conflict of interest. If they were attorneys representing their clients before a court, they would be prohibited from doing kind of that kind of rule setting and, and line drawing. Um, and, they've, and, they, and even if some of them say, well, the Constitution requires that we do it or something, there's plenty of other states that have done it better. Um, there are ways to, 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 to uh, give them some sort of final approval. But if you can take the origin of the line drawing and have it not be with the guy who then has to run in that district in November, we'd be better off. Um, and if, and if they want to think that, well, that's just our job and we don't want to give it to an unelected body and, you know, we're better able to, we're, we're more accountable to our uh, constituents if you let us draw the lines. And I would just point you back to that 600-dot slide is that they're not very accountable to their constituents because they pick them. Uh, so they can pick whichever ones they want. Um, so uh, an independent commission would be, would be a, a huge leap forward in this. Um, but that's not enough, because I think you also have to give the independent commission some basic nonpartisan criteria. Um, most of this I'll talk about for a second is jurisprudence handed down from the courts when they look at redistricting, and they kind of give general ideas of what would be a good thing to do. Things like respecting jurisdictional boundaries, right? Uh, respecting communities of interest, neighborhoods, precincts, and uh, racial and ethnic minorities. There's also the Voting Rights Act. But the most important thing we could do for, to give this commission criteria would be to tell them what, to not use something specifically. Not only do we proactively prescribe things, but to not use political data when you do this. It's specifically, we don't want you to know when you're drawing the district, is it 53.8% Democrat? That's not fair. That doesn't serve any legit government purpose. It only serves an incumbent protection program, and that's not, not a valid concern of our citizens. Now, people are generally going to know that. I'm from Richmond. Generally, Richmond's a Democratic um, stronghold. Uh, that's fine. If you're, from, if you're from Powhatan, that's generally a Republican stronghold. And that's fine. So you're going to know, generally speaking, what kind of person. But you're not going to be able to know exactly how safe that district is. Is it a 49 or a 52? You might not know. And that will be OK. Um, a, a valid question would be, can we prohibit them from using that? And, and the answer is, we can do it statutorily. We can put this in the Constitution. Um, but I've done this as the League of Women Voters and some other partners in 2011 held a redistricting competition across the state where colleges and law schools, I was in law school at the time, uh, participated and actually drew districts. They gave us the software to draw the districts. And it's simpler than you'd think because all you have to do is not check the box that says political data. And it won't populate as you draw on your computer the political data. It'll populate other things you might need, but, but not political data. And so you can just gray that box out and not allow the the, the, the folks drawing the lines to do it. Now, will people second guess it? Will people look over your shoulder and figure it out? Probably. But if we can, if we can get this independent commission to do this fairly, we'll be in better shape. Um, when we talk about redistricting reform, there's a couple things that if, if you guys are, are, are so amenable to, to be advocates for us going forward, I, I think this is the best way to talk about it. First is the conflict of interest. It's, it's an inherent conflict of interest for politicians to draw their own voter maps and to pick their own voters. Uh, most people, by the way, when you say gerrymandering or redistricting reform, don't know what you're talking about and, and don't get it. So the key to get people to care about it is to talk about the conflict of interest that this involves. Um, and the second part is that politicians are manipulating elections. And I, I've thought of many a times about a better way to sugarcoat that and say it differently, but there really isn't. I mean, they, they are changing the outcomes of elections um, by uh, picking their voters and carving up our neighborhoods. There's really kind of only two ways about it. 
And then plenty of people think that, that just there's if only there were enough moderates, they would solve this 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 problem, um, or if only there were enough Democrats, or if only there were enough moderate Republicans, or whatever, this problem would go away. And that's simply not true. Um, in fact, the Tea Party is a huge supporter of this. Ken Cuccinelli is one of the biggest ref, uh, redistricting reform experts I know. And some people say, well, Brian, what's he trying to do? And he's just trying to draw fair lines. And same thing on the on the left. We've got uh, plenty of great supporters um, uh, from from uh, Luis Lucas sponsored one of our key bills this year. So we've got a, a great swath of, of folks that are uh, in favor of this. It's a bi they recognize it's a bipartisan problem, and it does have a bipartisan solution. And the last kind of talking point in this is people say, well, you can't design competitive districts. We're not talking about that. Not every place in the Commonwealth will be competitive. And that's okay because the, not every place in the Commonwealth should have that if the people get their say drawn up in a fair way. Um, some districts will be competitive. I think arguably more will be competitive than are now, but um, which is hard to go any place but up because there aren't very many competitive districts anymore. But uh, if we do this right, we'll have some non-competitive districts and we'll have some competitive districts, and it'll just be more a result of the fair redistricting criteria than it will be of any uh, intentional design to draw it competitively or not competitively. Um, a lot of folks talk to me about this. Is this a long shot? And it is. It's totally a long shot. Getting those nice hobbits to give up their ring is, is tough. Um, but I don't think it is historically when you think about it. We're not the longest shot in voting rights that there's been, right? In fact, we're far from it. And I feel like if, if the, the, the ghost of these movements past could talk to us about our redistricting reform movement, they would say, you guys got this. You can do it. It'll happen. It's going to happen. You just got to keep up. Um, and a lot of and these folks fo fought for a lot harder than uh, than our organization's been around, and that our predecessor organizations have been around to get the right uh, to vote and the right to have it may, have it mean something when they do vote. Um, so here's our ask for everybody, um, which is tell your your representatives in Richmond um, sign the petition, donate. If you sign the petition on on our on our website, it automatically sends a, a letter saying an email saying you support that to your local senator and delegate. Um, any social media love, you guys, if you're Facebook, Twitter, we'd love the, the help. Um, but the number one thing in all of this is keep the conversation going. It's these kinds of conversations with the, with the town councils or with the local rotaries or Kiwanis clubs or the women's clubs of wherever it is in Virginia that's going to matter. We have to take this from a bad vote that otherwise good politicians mostly take once every decade. We have to make this a broader conflict of interest story that doesn't just go away. Um, so we appreciate your help in that. We would love for the the town council here to uh, adopt a resolution in support of redistricting reform with an independent commission and with nonpartisan criteria. Um, we would certainly appreciate that. And any kind of help or advocacy you guys want to do, we would love to empower that. Um, so with that, I'll just say uh, thank you all very much. I'm happy to take questions, but I know I've taken up a lot of your time, and I'm very grateful for it. So thank you. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Cannon? Easy enough. Okay, well, thank you again, and I'm sure members of council will continue the discussion, and if it's the will of council to get a resolution, we'll, we'll do that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you again.